Hey everybody, it's time for Summer Rewind. We are a part of a body of thousands and thousands of believers that we will never come in contact. We may never be in the same room with them, but as we hear ministries of varied people all over the world that we may never get to hear their ministry any other way, we bring it to you into your home. And we join with brothers and sisters that have heard those same messages and received new perspective, we broaden our understanding, and we have familiarity with other parts of the community of believers. And yes, there will even be a couple of sermons from right here at home. They were benchmark messages that we feel like that the Spirit told us something very important that we want to revisit. So whether you choose to worship with a group of friends and family, or you're just a community of one, remember that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you are becomes an edifice of worship. I trust you will gain strength and insight and fresh faith as we are fed and challenged by His Word.
I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life when I've cried out to God saying, no more pain. The message you are about to hear brought me great understanding about suffering. Hebrews 5.8 speaks of Jesus learning obedience through the things which he suffered. Though he was God in human form, his humanity still had to be brought into subjection to his divinity. I pray that as you listen to this message, The Cup, by Brother Morgan, that you will allow it to soak into your bones. There is purpose in our pain. The greater the pain, the greater the destiny. If you have a Bible, and uh, want to turn with me to the book of Matthew.
Matthew chapter 20, and I will begin reading at verse number 20. We briefly talked about this yesterday, but the bishop of Zen and I, and then this morning as I was seeking the Lord, he very strongly directed me to this particular passage of scripture. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? And she said unto him, grant thy, these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy, on the left in thy kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Amen. Of whom it is prepared of my Father. There are certain people that God has certain things prepared for. Not everybody can go there. These are just certain things and certain places. Amen. I want to talk to you today about the cup. The cup. Everybody say the cup. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning, shall we? Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for the worship and the praise, the atmosphere here today, God, that is saturated with your presence. We ask that you speak to us. We need you today, Lord. We ask that you open our understanding. We need a word from you today, God. We ask that you open our minds, and not just our minds, but our spirits, we believe you to do it in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to uh, I want to share with you a little personal story and uh, maybe just give you a little idea of where we're coming from today. I was privileged in uh, a few years ago, I guess it started somewhere around 1999 or 2000, there were several um, crusade endeavors that were going on in the Philippines and we had been invited to participate. And after the main crusade in Manila and across the Philippines, I uh, went back through Hong Kong and then we went over into mainland China and visited just briefly and then we flew back to the States. And uh, that was somewhere in January of... 2001. On in February of 2001, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's uh, I just will tell you that on February the 19th, 2001, I woke up to what I would call a living hell. Uh, there was a darkness that came on me. I went to the doctors uh, after a while. They tried to find what was going on. They could not find it. Finally, one of the doctors just said, You're, uh, you are having severe panic attacks and you just need them. I prayed. I prayed by the hour every day I prayed. I would literally pace through the house, Brother Willoughby, just praying. There's sometimes I would spend six, seven hours a day just pacing through the house rebuking and trying to get this off of me. And uh, after a few days, I began to wonder uh, what, what's going on here. And then a few weeks passed, and it just didn't want to lift. And so I uh, was getting a drink of water one morning. And uh, matter of fact, by this time, several months had passed. And I was at the kitchen sink getting a drink of water, and I had a glass that looked a whole lot like that glass. And so I was standing there getting ready to take a drink. 
the Lord spoke to me and said, how many ounces will that uh, cup hold? How much will that cup hold? And I looked at it and I told him what I thought. He said, that's all that cup is designed to hold. That's it. It can't hold any more than what it was built to hold. And little did I know that at that moment would begin a journey into the understanding of what Jesus meant when he said, the cup. A few services later, I was at the Modesto Missions Conference and Sister Vesta Mangan was speaking. She turned and said, I feel like I have a word for you. And uh, she did not know what was going on, but she turned and she gave to me from the book of Isaiah. And if you don't mind, I'd like to take you there just for a moment. <clears throat> she began to quote, so this is, the, this is the word that the Lord has given to you today in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse number 22. Thus saith the Lord thy thus saith thy Lord the Lord and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people, behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury, thou shalt no more drink it again. But I will put into the hand of them that afflict thee, I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, Bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. I was thankful for what she spoke to me. Didn't quite understand the total significance of it until a few days later. As the Lord began to direct me into this particular understanding, I uh, began to realize in all of my life, it was hard for me to believe that God was talking to me about the cup because when we mentioned the cup, from the New Testament, we always think of Jesus as he's praying in the wilderness. As he's looking at what's about to take place, we've always preached that the cup that Jesus was going to drink was the cup of sin. And so uh, as I began to look at this, I realized that I, I, I don't think that it was the cup of sin. And I'll explain that to you. When, when the mother of James and John comes to Jesus... Her request was pretty simple. The Bible says that she came and worshiped with James and John. And as Jesus viewed it, he asked her, said, there's some particular thing that you want, that you desire. What is it that you are going to ask? And her request was, I want one of my boys to sit at your right hand and the other on the left hand in your kingdom. In other words, I want them to have authority. I want them to have high-ranking places in your kingdom. Jesus, he was very quick to her. He said, uh, can they drink of the cup that I will drink of? And her reply was, oh, they'll, they'll drink of the cup. And he said, it's almost with a, a, a regret or a sadness that he says it. They really will indeed drink of that cup. He said, now for me to give those positions, I cannot do that because that is prepared by my father. I do not have the right to give those positions. That is that is the position. I know that he's speaking in his flesh. He's speaking in his humanity. What he's saying is, is in the kingdom of God, these are only places that are prepared for certain people. I cannot, I cannot in my humanity put you there. I've come today to tell you that places in the spirit, there is no human being alive that can put you into places of God's kingdom of spiritual authority. It's impossible. Amen. I, I looked at that, and when he offered them the cup, if you take that in light of the offering in the garden when he's praying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I cannot for the life of me believe that the cup is the cup of sin and that God would offer that cup to his disciples to drink. His purpose was to defeat sin. His purpose was to conquer sin. He was not going to invite them to participate or to take sin on. So I've come today to tell you that I do not believe that the cup that Jesus was in reference to that day was the cup of sin. But Jesus was in reference to the cup of suffering. Amen. 
When he was in the garden, the Bible lets us know that at the Mount of Transfiguration that Moses and Elijah had come to him. The great apostle Paul makes a statement, and I mentioned it to Bishop Willoughby yesterday. The great apostle Paul makes a statement to one of the churches. He said, I not only want to know him in the power of his resurrection, but in the fellowship of his suffering. I recognize today that the fellowship of suffering is not something that we talk about much. It's just kind of like the subject that we want to pass by. We don't like it because in our world today, we live in such a culture of we want to be blessed and we want everything great and we want everything successful. But the fact is that if you hold any place of authority or power in the kingdom of God, there's going to come a moment in your life that God is going to say of you, just like he said of James and John, can they drink the cup that I will drink of? Amen. Can they suffer with me as I will have to suffer? When the Apostle Paul makes reference that he wanted to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. There is, and I, I, I hesitate to use this word, but there is like an elite group that enters into this place of suffering. When Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, he is in the fellowship of suffering with those who had suffered before him. He's talking to Moses and he's talking to Elijah. They've already been there. They've already been to the moment that they had to suffer. The things, the moment came that they were moved beyond the, the, the temporal into the eternal. It's at that place that Moses and Elijah speak with Jesus about the things that he would suffer in Jerusalem. Not only was he glowing that day, but they were talking to him about what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. They reminded him that Isaiah said that they will beat your face until they cannot recognize you. They reminded him of what Isaiah said when they told him he would be wounded, he would be beaten, stripes would be placed upon his back. But yet here they stand signifying to him, not only is there a moment of suffering and a moment of crisis, but there's also something beyond that moment. There's something way beyond that moment. We stand here with you this day, Christ, recognizing that there is something beyond it. Amen. I believe that's the reason why that the writer of Hebrews makes the statement, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Amen. Somebody said amen. He endured the cross. He endured the cross. There is a special place. You know, if, uh, if you're going to tell me about being able to make it, I'd at least like to know that you've got a little test in your life yourself. There's a lot of people. I, I, we used to have a man that come through and preach for us a lot of times, and he would, uh, he would preach about the provisions of God and God providing and miracles, financial miracles that would happen. And, and uh, man, he'd tell these stories, and they were so exciting. And I, I thought, man, those, those are really great stories. I, I'd like some of them stories myself. <laughs> Little did I know that if you have testimony, the first part of that is spelled T-E-S-T, -E test. And if you don't have any test in your moaning, Then it's just that. And, uh, I mean, he come through talking about, uh, one time he's talking about where he was in a special service and the Lord moved on him to give. And he said, Lord, I've, I've only got just a little bit of money. And the Lord said, I want you to give it. So he said, I, I gave it. And, and he said, I went to the room and I, I didn't quite know how I was going to get home the next day. I, he said, I did have a credit card. And I thought, well, I guess I'll have to. And he said he checked out of the hotel, and on his way out, the Lord spoke to him. He said it was about 5, 36 o'clock in the morning, spoke to him and said, knock on that door right there. He said, now, I'd seen the man that had gone in that room, and he said he was a, a real big man. And uh, he said, you don't just knock on someone's room at 5, 30 in the morning that you don't know and tell them the Lord told me to knock on your door. And so he said, uh, especially if he's a big man, <laughs> And he said, I went, to, uh, I went to the truck to get leave. And he said, the Lord said, go back and knock on the door. So he said, I went back and knocked on the door. And he said, the man opened it. He said, oh, it's you. I'll be right back. He said, I didn't know if he was going to go get a gun or what, he said. But he said, a few seconds later, he, he opened the door back up. And he said, he stuck several $100 bills through the door and said, take it before I change my mind. 
And he, he told those stories. He talked about uh, how that they would be in a, a moment of crisis, financial crisis, and he'd go to his closet and pray and would reach into his pockets and he'd find money in his pockets. He said, I knew I wasn't in there. And he told all these stories, and I thought these were great stories, and I'd like to have some of them stories. But little did I know that in order for me to have those stories, can I talk to you just a moment about the backdrop of Revelation? Right. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, we wonder sometimes, you know, well, I, I want God to reveal himself to me. As a miracle worker, well, the only way that God can reveal himself to you as a miracle worker is to put you in a situation where you need a miracle. <laughs> and the Bible lets us to know that there's six, seven days of creation. Every creative day starts the same. It says, and the evening and the morning was the first day, and the evening and the morning was the second day. So everything that God gets ready to create in your life or to reveal to you does not start in the morning. It always starts in the evening. It's always the negative that comes first because you would have absolutely no way to comprehend or value what he's trying to show you unless the opposite had come first. So anytime that God gets ready to reveal something to you, he does not just reveal that, he reveals the opposite first so you have a contrast so that you have knowledge of what he's really trying to show you. Moses would have never known that he was a way maker until God had put him before the Red Sea and mountains on both sides and Pharaoh's army hot on his trail. He would have never known that. You'll never know the things of God until God puts you in the situations that's opposite of what he really intends to show you. That's the only way that God has to reveal to you. I realize where I'm at, what I'm about to say, but if God's going to reveal himself to a healer to you, then somebody's got to get sick. If God's going to show you that he's a deliverer, somebody's got to be bound. But we don't stop at the, at the evening experience. Amen. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And just as sure as there's an evening, there's a morning. And whatever it is that God's trying to show you, you just got to hang on until the morning comes. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. I mean, after that, I, I told God, and this is what I want to talk to you about. I pray, say, oh, God, I want some of them neat little stories. I like to tell some of them stories. I mean, that guy can create more faith in five seconds than people I know in a lifetime. And little did I know that God was going to answer my request. And so instead of the angels coming bringing money, the devils came and brought debt. And things got tight. And I know you've never been there, Bishop, ever in your life. But things got tight and things. And, and I mean, I was like, God, what in the world are you doing to me? You're, you're, you know, this is. Hmm. Well, you wanted a testimony. Yeah, but I didn't realize this was the process. <laughs> Can I take the request back? I mean, let me get into this. Lord, let, let my boys. He said, this is prepared for my, my father, but I do know enough about the process to ask you, can you drink the cup that I'll drink of? So that day standing in front of that, we call it a kitchen sink. Look at that cup. How many ounces or how much will that cup hold? Because here's what happens. When God decides that you are going to hold a prepared place in his kingdom, the only way that he can entrust you with something like that is to give you the cup and say, before I let you reign with me, I want to see if you'll suffer with me. Hmm. And the sad fact is, is there's a lot of people that never get any further. They never finish drinking the cup. They only drink just a little bit of it, and it gets so heavy that they, they never finish the cup. They just drink part of the way down, and they stop. And these people ultimately become bitter. They become bitter. Matter of fact, uh, I, was, I was at a... Uh, I'm trying to think of how to explain some of this stuff. We call it a jiffy lube. It's a place where you'd go have your car serviced. And so I was in there, and I was sitting there, and 
there was a magazine there. I live in the state of California, and we're, California has a lot of uh, wine and wineries and stuff. And so I was looking at this magazine, and it was talking about how to make wine, the new methods versus the old methods of how to make wine. And uh, so I uh, was reading it, and uh, it was very interesting because what they begin to talk about, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. What they began to talk about was how that under the wine press, how that if you was in a wine press, a lot of them would have a, a, a pole or a stick that would be horizontal, and the, the people that would tread the grace would put a lot of their weight on that because the object was not to put so much weight on the grapes that you crush the seed. The object was only to crush it just enough to break the skin, to extract out of it the juices, but not to put so much weight on it that you crush the seed because if the seed become crushed, then the wine would be bitter. And I said to reading that, and the Holy Ghost said, this is exactly my process in your life. I want to put just enough on you that I do not break your spirit because if your spirit becomes broken, you are no good to me. I only want to put enough on you to break your will not your spirit, but your will. This is what happened to me in the garden when I prayed. Father, not my will, but thine be done. Because the heaviness of the spirit was pressing upon him. And God did not want to break his spirit. He wanted to break his will. And ultimately, the greatest test any of us have is that we have to be broken in our will. Our will has to be broken. Matter of fact, the scripture teaches us two bodies of water that we have to cross. In the Old Testament, the one's the Red Sea, which is a type of baptism that deals with our past. It removes our past. But the next body of water they had to cross was the Jordan River. And the Jordan deals with the will of man. It's where you die out to the things of your own desires and you live to the things of the Spirit. And there's a lot of people that have been baptized and are in the wilderness. And that's as far as they get. They live their whole spiritual existence in that wilderness. God providing, God taking care, manna falling, clothes, shoes. But they never pass over the Jordan into the maturity and into the place of the Spirit that God has designed for the apostolic church to dwell. They never come to that moment that they can pray, nonetheless, not my will, but thine be done. That is the hardest prayer that any of you will ever pray. This is where God brings us to. This is the moment that God brings us to. This is where God says, all right, all right. So your request is, now, let me borrow your brother's hand. Come up here a second. Can you drink this cup? I want you to drink all of it in just a second. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you only drink a part of it, that's where you'll stay in your life. That's it. I want you to drink it to the dregs. I want you to drink every bitter part of it. And here's the deal. This, Bishop, is where the enemy traps us. In the States, we have a deal called a bottomless cup. <laughs> you can go to the 7-Eleven and pay a certain amount of money and go back in and just refill that cup anytime you want to refill it. You can tell. <laughs> and the enemy makes us think that there is absolutely no end to that cup. That is the only cup that you're going to drink from now. There is no end to it. It just, keeps, it, it just keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And as you're drinking it, you keep thinking, my God, is there no end to this thing? Is this ever going to stop? How much does this cup hold? But I remind you today that that cup can only hold whatever you could put in it. And when God designs your cup, not my cup, your cup. When God designs that cup for your life, he knows exactly the size of it. He knows how much it holds. He knows how much it... That's it. And you know what? You know, this is, this is what, this is what really kind of messes with people because, you know, your cup may not be as large as the next person's cup. It all is determined by God because to whom much is given, much is required. And when God looks at certain people, he says, you, I choose you. I have a certain place prepared for you in the kingdom. I have a place of authority and a place of power for you in the kingdom. And I've come today to tell Tabernacle of Joy, God, for some unknown reason that I don't know, you probably already got a 
figured out. But he looked at this congregation and said, I've got some places of authority in the kingdom that I want to take you to. There are very few churches that can enter into this territory. There are very few churches that can come to this place. You cannot compare yourself to any other congregation. You don't know what their cup is. You don't understand that. But the will of God is he looked at this congregation and said, I have a cup designed for you. We don't understand altogether why, but it's the will of God. I've got somewhere for you to stand at my right hand and left hand. I have places in authority in the kingdom that very few people have ever visited. And I offer you that this day. Can you drink the cup that I will drink of? But I've come today from California to tell you it is not what we would call a bottomless cup. It doesn't just keep getting filled up. It is only designed to hold so much. And once that cup has been drank, there is no more coming. Because the prophet Isaiah said, and the cup of fury, hold that, I will take from your hand. That's it, no more. And whatever has been tormenting you, I'm not trying to pick on you, I'm going to put that cup into the hands of what has afflicted you. And you, uh, can we, I don't know if we should do this or not. Hold that, Brother White. Go back to Isaiah. Ask Timothy, I don't want to do anything that would disrespect you but we're just kind of acting out okay so I, can you just kind of lay there now this is what has been afflicting and this is what Isaiah said I'm going to take that cup out of your hand and put it in his hand and then I'm going to put him in the street of your city and I'm going to cause you to put your foot on him and to pass over him you know what that means in the scripture it is, it's, it's a typology of a conquering king that when he finally conquered another king, he would put his foot on his neck and walk over him in the streets of the city signifying that you have conquered him. And I've come today to tell Tabernacle of Joy that there is something that has afflicted you, but the cup of God is going to be taken out of your hand and put into the hand of your enemy. And whatever has afflicted, you're going to put your foot on it. I said, you're going to put your foot on it. I said, you're going to put your foot on it. Yes. Oh, I just, I just don't see. You know what? Get ready to help me, brother. You just keep drinking. Come here. Hold that just a second. Just get ready. <laughs> Bishop, I don't mind telling you, there's been a lot of days I've looked at that cup and said, God, how much can that thing hold? How much? And I've had the enemy try to come and say, here, I'm going to pour some more in there. And the angel of the Lord comes and says, no, this has been designed by God. It can only hold so much. And I'm not going to let you pour anything beyond that. I have set the limitations. We just keep drinking. And the farther down you get, the more bitter it tastes. How long, oh Lord? Mm. How long, oh God? How long? Praise him a moment here. Are you ready?
Perfect timing. Now, what do I do with that cup? God said, I'm going to take it out of your hand. I'm going to put it in the hand of your enemy. I'm going to give you authority over him. I'm going to give you dominion. Oh, that brother's in. But our hand was never designed to be empty. Never. Once that cup has been drank, God has another cup. Hmm. And this is what the psalmist David said about that cup. Where's my good brother going to help me here? We don't need that cup anymore. We got a new one. See, what, what we fail to realize is this life is nothing more but a test to see what God can trust you with in the next life. All those parables that Jesus gives about talents and stewards and, and all this stuff, all that is is he said, you know what, if I could, I'm just going to test you with some stuff. I'm going to test you here. And I find that there are two tests that God gives us in life. Can, can I talk about this just a second? There's two tests. One is time and the other is finances. Before God trusts you with eternity, he tests you with time. And before God trusts you with true riches, which is his glory, he tests you with his finances. I want to see what you do. Before I give you certain things, I'm going to test to those that came and were faithful, he said, I'm going to make you rule over, over cities. Can you imagine? Can you imagine in the next life to come, in the, that great age that's coming, Bishop, that God says, you know what? You're not just going to rule over one city. I'm going to put you over cities. And all this stuff, it's just to see if I can trust you. Because there's no more test in that life. You've proven to me to be faithful. Is this making sense to anybody? You've proven to me to be faithful. And that's what all this stuff is. I don't know why Christians get so upset when something happens and tribulations come. Because it's like, oh my God, what have I, you haven't done anything. Quit thinking you've done something. It's just the will of God. You don't believe that? What did the, what did the writer Job say? Do we just receive good at the hand of God and not evil? Are you listening to me? The test of your faith is not every time you pray that God does something. Brother Wright came to me in August, and he may have shared this to you uh, this last August at the Episodic Conference. He said, I have something to tell you. I said, all right. He said, you need to study the, the sifting of Simon Peter. And I said, okay. He said, what was the sifting of Simon Peter? He said, Simon proved he wasn't afraid to die for Jesus. He's the only one that pulled the sword. I mean, in the garden, he pulled the sword. Jesus said, put it up, Simon Peter. That's not how, that's not how this kingdom's going to come. That's not how it's going to happen. And you know what? When God puts us in these positions, we're ready to pull the sword and go to fight. And he said, put it up. This is not how the kingdom's going to operate. This is not how my authority operates. Put it up. It's not going to come by your means. Put your sword up. And Simon Peter's looking at this stuff, and he said, I mean, it just violated everything he thought about the kingdom and how the kingdom was supposed to operate. Jesus is going to be our Messiah. He's going to be a great military leader. He's going to raise an army up. We're going to push Rome back. It's going to be a wonderful thing. And Jesus said, put it up. He violated everything that Simon Peter had thought about the kingdom. And we've all got concepts about the kingdom, how it's supposed to operate. And we've all got our own sword that we're willing to pull. So I will, but he said, you know what? He tells us sometimes, put that sword up. It's not coming the way you think it's going to come. Put it up. And then now he's, Simon Peter's at the fire, and what really messes with him is he knows that at any moment Jesus could have called for 10,000 legions of angels and stopped the whole thing, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. And the sifting and the testing of your faith is, is when you know God can, but for some reason he chooses not to. That is what messes with our faith. That is what messes. This is the trial of your faith. I got news for you. 
You know what? You know what? The, I'm sorry. I wasn't going to get into this, but I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. And, uh, let me come back sometime and I'll preach a lot of victory and cast out devils and raise the dead if you want me to. But right now I need to do this. S -s Satan goes before the throne. I don't understand all that, but he goes before the throne. And the term there, Satan, Satan is, is adversary. Not just this thing with the pitchfork and the horns and all this stuff, but your adversary. All of you have an adversary. And he goes before the throne. And it was God. It was not the devil. It wasn't Satan that said, hey, could I go get Job? It was God. Where are you going? Oh, to and fro. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him. I have something prepared for him. There's none like him in all the world. And the devil says, I can't get to him. Watch this. I can't get to him. you got to hedge around him. And this is what he says. Does Job serve you for naught? You know what that means? Do you think that he just serves you for nothing? If you took those blessings from him, he would deny you. He wouldn't serve you. And God says, let's see. And this is the test of your faith. And everybody here, you ready for it? Everybody here will not es escape that test. Your faith is going to go on trial at some point in time. And the devil and God's going to have the same conversation. Does Zen see us serve you for not? And there's three areas that you will be tested. Finances, health, and family. It will come. You cannot escape it. Because if everything that you pray for, God just gave to you. You wouldn't just serve God because you love him. You serve God because he just keeps blessing and keeps blessing and keeps blessing and keeps blessing. And so God says, I'm going to have to see if you really love me the way you ought to love me. And the only way I can do this is to test it. And so here, here. But the trial of your faith is what Peter said. Remember who wrote that? Simon. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail thee not. And when you're in that sifting and that trying, there's sometimes you can't even pray and you don't even know what to pray for. But the great intercessor himself says, I'm going before the throne for you to pray for you because I want to see if you're going to, you got to make it through this. And I've come today to tell you, you have a great intercessor right now. Yeah. I, I'm getting into too much stuff here. Let me tell you something. When he goes before the throne and prays for you, he goes with perfect faith. He goes in perfect righteousness. He knows exactly what to pray when you don't even pray. For likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For when we know not what we should pray for as we ought, the Spirit itself maketh intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so when the sifting's on and the trial and the cup and you don't even think you can make it, what you don't even understand is your great intercessors before the throne praying for you in perfect faith and righteousness saying they've got to make it. 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 And even while I preach today, the great intercessor is before the throne over tabernacle of joy, praying for you, praying for you, praying for you. When you were up here a while ago worshiping and praying in tongues as you were encouraged to do, what you didn't know is that was the Spirit saying, I've come today to make intercession. I'm going to pray through you and for you. And this is what Paul taught the active ministry of the Holy Ghost was for to the church at Rome. Now, that cup, no more. God says, here. Pastor Timothy, can I borrow you again? Here. You've drink that cup. Hold it right there. Just kind of stand on the side so they can see. Now, the psalmist said it like this. Thou anointest my head with oil. Anybody know the rest of that? And my what? The only cup that just keeps getting poured into it is not the cup of suffering. Yeah. It's God's cup of blessing. And once he can entrust you and that cup is empty and it's no more. That's it. No more. Now here, here's my cup of blessing. Pour it in there, Zen. Pour it to the top and then stop. That's a nice blessing, isn't it? 
I remember when all this stuff started nine years ago, Brother Willoughby, David Shatwell called me. They had no idea. So, Mark, I was praying for you this morning. The Lord told me to tell you. Matter of fact, let me back up. Sister Chanel, friends with the dance. She called me when it first started. Before it started, she said, oh, son. She said, I'm so troubled. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I see a dark cloud coming your way. You know, why can't people call me and say, I, I see a million dollars coming your way. <laughs> it's always these, you know. She said, matter of fact, people fail to understand that before you ever get God's light, darkness comes first. Because when God come down on that mountain to the people of God, the Bible says he came down in a thick cloud of darkness. And the other people couldn't take it, and they went running in fear. But oh, Moses, he just started walking up through that darkness, climbing up the mountain. And you just remember this, there is absolutely no dignity in the darkness. You're just clawing and grabbing and hanging on. You can't even see what's in front of you, but you just keep climbing. And he finally broke through the darkness and got to the top of the mountain, and there was light there. And you know what God said to him, Bishop? God said, Moses, here's why I had to do this. Because if the people would have broke through and gazed upon me, they would have perished. I am not interested in the curiosity seeker. This was a special thing to bring you to this mountain. This is where I'm going to show you some things and I'm going to write some things that nobody else will ever get. God have mercy. I said, Sister, you know what? She said, Son, in it you will meet Satan. Satan himself will appear to you. Great. Like you could have said one of his little imps. <laughs> I mean, I had people call and say stuff like that or I see the Antichrist and you squaring off. My God, just send one of his little low rank people you know just no then brother shat will call and said mark i don't know what's going on but he said the lord said the the joy of what you will birth will make the pain of birthing it dim in comparison and so here's how it works we are all set and god says okay here's my cup of blessing and he pours it in there and we think that's a wonderful blessing and god says oh no 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 that's not how this works. That was that cup. That's the cup of suffering. This is my cup of blessing. And my cup, hold it over there. Hallelujah. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, no, 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 we're not through. And God just keeps pouring it on you. And you think that's about all you can stand. God said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I got more. I got more. I got more revival. I got more nations. I have more ministry. I have more anointing. I have more power. You haven't even begun to see what I've got for you. And then you think that's about all I can take. And God says, oh, you ain't begun. I'm just getting started. You can't even build a big enough cup to hold my blessing. There is not a cup big enough to hold the blessing of God in your life. That's how come it just keeps running and it keeps running and it keeps running. And just you, you think, I can't take no more. And it just keeps coming and it keeps coming and it keeps coming. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You've had the cup of suffering here. Absolutely no doubt you've had the cup of suffering. And it's a bitter cup. I can't even begin to imagine. I have, there have been times in praying for you, I said, please, God, I don't even want to visit what the man feels. I, I, I don't even want to visit it. I can't imagine living there. I don't know what God's plan is, what God's designed, but I do know one thing. According to that scripture, that cup is only designed to hold so much. And when it's over, it's over. And Bishop, when he starts pouring that out, I just want to kind of be in the, the, the you know, little down here somewhere just kind of flowing down <laughs> because it's going to come. 
You, you, you haven't even begun to see the revival. You guys haven't even begun to see what God's about to do. And the afflictions and all the stuff God says. And this is the basic part about I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you authority. You are going to hold a certain place of authority in my kingdom. Brother Morgan, why have we suffered? Because it's an answer to a prayer request. Use us, God. Give us this authority, and God says, okay. And you know what? Here's what I find amazing. At any time, you could have said, no more. And I really believe that God would have honored it. To see what separates you from other people is. You said, I'm not going to let go of this until he does in me what he's going to do. And you'll understand this, they meant, but that's what separates the men from the boys. I have young preachers, I told you last night, come by every once in a while. Oh, Brother Morgan, I want a, I want a double portion. Hmm. 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 I don't think you want days. No, you don't. I had a boy that showed up the other day, a young evangelist. He sat in the car, and, and, and he was driving, and I sat on the passenger seat, and he said, God told me to come out here and to fight your battle for you, so I'm going to take it off of you, and I'm going to pick this fight up. I just kind of looked at him. He said, what? I said, I don't, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, Brother Morgan, I'm young and got a lot of strength. And he said, you know, I said, son, this ain't got nothing to do with physical strength. <laughs> Your physical strength can go. It's, it's a matter of spiritual fortitude. And the next week he gets hit by something. He calls, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. I, don't, I said, well, you're the one that said you wanted the fight. It's just getting started. <laughs> oh, but this is not what I expected. I said, well, what did you expect? You enlisted in the army. They're firing real bullets. Well, I, I just, I just, I just, I'm hurrying to a close. Huh. You know what? I'll tell you why I come on this trip. I come on because somebody called me and told me, you go on that trip, it's going to be some of the finishing parts of your cup. It's all tied together. And said, when you get over there, God's going to give you all authority over a prince in China. I said, really? And I trust this person. Yeah. So you want Brother Willoughby? I don't understand it all. Except that. And ain't hardly anything left. It's almost over. Matter of fact, a while ago, the Lord said, it's a new day. And so I just come to tell you, there's another cup coming. It's a cup of blessing. God's going to bless this congregation, bless this church. He's going to bless the ministry. He's going to bless you. That's where it's at. Are you ready? You guys think you can handle this? You think you can handle millions of people being directly affected by this church? I'm asking you an honest question. Do you think you can handle that kind of... Does this church think it can handle that kind of blessing? Apparently it does or God wouldn't have given you the other cup. And so God's blessing is just going to be poured out. Woo. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And you know what? You got to get your eyes off what you're enduring and see the joy that's set before you. Look beyond it and say, you know what? Weeping may endure for the night, but there's a new day coming to this church. And I've come today to speak that in the Holy Ghost. There's a new day coming to this church. There's a cup of blessing coming to this church. That cup of sorrow, that cup of suffering is just about over. You're down to the last dregs of it. And it's a bitter cup. But hey, if you endure with him, you're going to reign with him. And oh, what a place of authority and power and the spirit that God's going to give. If you believe that, I wish somebody would clap their hands and magnify God right now. Come on, let's really magnify him. I ask the Holy Ghost to bear witness of this today. Let there be a witness of the Holy Ghost in this place. 
I say don't wait till the battle's over. Go ahead and shout now. This darkness is going to pass. Glory to God in the highest. This darkness is going to pass. This darkness is going to pass. There's a new day coming. Woo! Oh, hallelujah. I think we ought to continue to praise him here a moment. We ought to continue to praise him here. Go on, worship him. Let the cup of blessing come into this place today and drink from it. Let the cup of healing and deliverance and authority and power come into this place today. Drink from it. Go on and drink from it today. I don't know what some of you is waiting on. God wants to put the cup of blessing in your hand right now. Let this church drink today from the cup of God's blessing. Let there be a move of the Holy Ghost and a witness of the Spirit right now. Reach over and take someone by the hand close to you. Let's, I want you to stand if you can. Reach over and take someone by the hand. We're going to drink from the cup of blessing today. My cup runneth over. Let there be a flow of the Spirit. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let there be a flow of the Holy Ghost right now. Go and lift your voice and fervently begin to cry out and to magnify God.
Can I tell you something, just something I feel right now? And if, if it's what I feel here is James, James is put in prison, Bishop. Church prayed. No deliverance. Bible says that Herod killed him with the sword. Now Peter's in prison. Peter's in prison. And Herod has the same design. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And the Bible says in the church, pray without ceasing unto God for him. They just kept praying. And all of a sudden at midnight hour, at the midnight, the dawning of a new day, an angel walks into that prison. He goes past all the guards. He goes past the chains. He goes past it all. Walks right into that prison. Walks right. And he, he shone a light on Simon Peter. Said, Arise, gird thyself. Come on, I'm going to take you out of here. And he took him by the hand and started leading past it. I mean, he, he, had, he had two soldiers, one on each side. He's chained. There's a hundred guards surrounding him. And, and this angel says, I don't care what it looks like. I've been sent to get you out of here. And he takes him right out. Takes him outside, takes him past the iron gate, takes him into the city. And he says, now you know where to go? And Simon Peter said, I do. And Simon Peter headed down to the prayer meeting. And he gets to the prayer meeting and he knocks on the door. <laughs> and Rhoda gets up from the prayer meeting and she goes and who's there? Simon Peter. <laughs> right. We're sorry. You can't be Simon because we're praying for Simon in here to be delivered. And, and he said, no, really, it's me, Rhoda. I'm telling you, it's me. So he said, okay. And, and she hey, it really is him. So she goes into where they're praying and says, hey, guys, you can quit praying now. Simon said, Peter, he's out the door. He's knocking out the door. And somebody, we need to let him in. And they said, Rhoda, Rhoda, stop, 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 stop. Something's wrong with your mind, Rhoda. Pray some more. She said, we don't have to pray about this anymore. He's out the door. Rhoda, no. You're mad. You've lost your mind. You're starting to believe what you're praying for. Rhoda said, I'll be right back. She goes back to the door and says, Simon, I'm trying to look at him. I'll be, she goes back and you know what they said? It's his ghost. The Jewish concept was they've already killed him. Herod went ahead and did it prematurely. He, he's going to die in the morning, but, but Herod went ahead and killed him. Now his ghost, his spirit, you know, it wanders for three or four days according to Jewish custom. And his, his spirit's wandering, and now his ghost has come to our door, knocking at our door. And Rhoda said, you, you're the ones that are mad. I'm telling you, Simon Peter's out the door. Now, they're praying and we would like to make light of them, but you've got to remember, and I think you people ought to very well relate to this, they had prayed for one miracle and it didn't happen. And now they're praying and that miracle's at the door. But they're having trouble really believing. And I'm telling you, you got a miracle knocking at the door. Are you listening to me? You got a miracle knocking at the door. And I feel a little struggle in the spirit right now. Well, we don't see anything physical yet. You know what? If it's knocking at the door, it don't matter what you see. I hear something knocking at the door. Somebody today needs to say, you know what? It doesn't matter. We're going to open the door by faith and let the miracle come on inside. Oh, hang on, hang on. It gets better. It gets better. And Herod, that nasty Herod, got so arrogant because he could take James that when he goes down to Caesarea Philippi, he gives a speech and the people said, it's the voice of a God, not a man. And God said, that's it. You've become so proud in my presence, you're done. And the Bible says God killed him. You know how he killed him? Killed him with worms. Killed him. And God said, you're not taking the glory. And that spirit that is attacked has become so arrogant because God allowed a purpose to work and that spirit thinks it's so powerful. And now God says, I'm going to get Peter out of prison and I'm fixing to shame that spirit. I'm going to bring that spirit down. And I'm prophesying that God's going to bring that spirit down. Yes. 
somewhere in the end time, there's got to be an authority over the spirit of cancer. Some church, some congregation, somebody, God has to give dominion and authority. Take the cup out of its hand, out of your hand, and put it in the hand of your enemy, and put your foot on its neck. You may not be the church of Rome, but you are Singapore. And I'm going to tell you what Paul told the church of Rome. And my God of peace shall come shortly and bruise Satan under your heels. And I've come today to tell you that he's coming shortly to put it under your feet. Come on, Rhoda, go answer the door. Come on, Tabernacle of Joy. Go open the door and let the miracle come in. Your miracle's knocking at the door right now. Open the door and let it in.